Hello, everyone, and welcome to my lab. Are you ready to have some fun? Yeah. Are you ready to learn? Yeah. Well, here we go. What about this one? What about if we mix them together? You like that? Thank you. These are examples of what we call a combustion reaction. I want you to notice that I have my goggles on to protect my eyes from potential damage. We always obey the rules, the safety rules in my laboratory, and that's why we also have a fire extinguisher ready to be used just in case something goes out of control. We're not planning on anything going out of control, but just have it ready as a safety precaution. We obey the safety rules whenever we do scientific experiments. And that's why I want you now to learn that we, when we do scientific experiments, we always repeat them. And that's what we're going to do with this experiment, but we're going to do it in the dark, all right? So here we go. We'll have the lights off, and we spray the first liquid. And maybe we can have a little bit more darkness. We can do them together. Now, when you came to my lab, you saw that we have lots of chemicals and equipment on the tabletop, but you also saw, and you see right now, that we have some things up in the air. What do we have up in the air? Balloons. Well, how many balloons are there? Six. And what color are these balloons? Six. Yes, there are six balloons. Two are red, two are green, and two are yellow. What do you suppose we have in those balloons? Now, some of you are saying helium because you know from experience that helium-filled balloons are lighter than air. I'm going to tell you that there are other gases that are lighter than air, too. But helium is a gas that does not burn. And we're going to do an experiment to find out what's in those balloons by using another burner, this one here, which I will light. You can see it has a different color flame. It has a different shape to it. That's because the construction of this burner is different than the construction of the other burner. And what I'm going to do is bring this burner close enough to the balloon and then try to find out if there will be a fire or not. <laughs> so if there is a fire, then we know it's not helium. If there's no fire, then it is helium because helium is a gas that doesn't burn. Now, I see some of you are covering your ears. Why, do, why are you covering your ears? I, I bet you're covering your ears because you know from experience that there might be some sound energy. Not only, not only light energy and heat energy, but sound energy. So let's find out what's in this balloon. And the balloon simply popped, right? And now what, do we, what do we always do in science? Repeat the experiment. So let's repeat it with this balloon here. And those two balloons had in them the gas helium. Now we'll move on to the next set of experiments. What, I could put the torch down here and go on and do some other experiments, or I can continue with the balloons. What shall I do? Continue with the balloons? Yeah. All right, let's do that then. And I'll come to this balloon here and bring the flame to it. Did that balloon have helium in it? No. That balloon had in it the gas hydrogen. The element hydrogen is a gas at room temperature, and it's a gas that combines with oxygen in the air and in a combustion reaction and goes out of control. It's an uncontrolled combustion reaction, and that is what we call an explosion. So what do we always do in science? Repeat the experiment. That's what we're going to do now with this balloon, except we're going to do it in the dark. So with the lights off, the lights off, all the lights off. Here we go. You ready? <laughs> Did you see that ball of fire? What color was the ball of fire? Yellow. And, 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 and did you uh, see the ball of fire better with the lights on or with the lights off? Oh. 
that's something we should keep in mind if we're doing experiments and looking for the release of energy in the form of light. We should do the experiment under conditions that help us make better observations. What I would like you to do now is to watch a replay of the last experiment we did by looking at the monitors. And you will see in slow motion, there is the flame coming close to the balloon. No, you won't hear a sound. And there is that ball of fire that we saw from the previous experiment. Now you notice that when we moved from the helium-filled balloons to the hydrogen-filled balloons, that the volume of sound energy was increasing. And so I would like you to obey the safety rules and protect your eardrums from potential damage. What you should do is take both, both fingers and stick them in your ears very tightly. I can't do that and do the experiment at the same time. So I have with me some ear earplugs. So I'm going to put the earplugs in. I really would like everybody to protect their ear ears from potential damage by doing this. I can't hear you, but I can see some of you smiling. That means you heard what I said. Please protect your ears very carefully as we move on now to the next balloon that we have over here. You ready for this? Here we go. That balloon had in it a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen. There was a lot more oxygen available for the hydrogen to combine with. And we heard a much louder explosion. And we saw a much brighter combustion reaction. So what do we always do in science? So let's repeat this experiment. And let's do it now carefully with the ears very well protected. And let's do it in the dark. Let's take, let's take a, a quick look at the last experiment in slow motion. Once again, you won't hear any sound. There is the flame from the torch coming to the balloon, and there is a much faster reaction because of the oxygen that's available to the hydrogen for that uncontrolled combustion reaction. I'd like you to join in welcoming uh, Dr. Kristen Johnson, who's going to help with the next experiment. Kristen? <laughs> Hi, Kristen. Well, but Sam, here we have a 55-gallon uh, drum that I've been heating, and you can see there's, there's water in the bottom because there's steam coming out of the top. But actually, that really isn't steam, is it, but Sam? It's, it, it's condensed water vapor, it's yes. Condensed it's condensed water vapor. Water is boiling, and, and, the, and the water uh, is condensing as it comes out. So you gonna, what are you going to do now? Well, I'm going to seal it up. All right. Whoops. I'm trying to seal it up. OK. Try to seal it up, all right. OK, let's, let's put it up here on this so everybody can see okay. it. OK, one, two, two three. three. Okay, let's turn off the flames here. Turn so off the flames. And then I'm going to make sure it's really tight in here. So I just want to crank this down a little bit. Whoa! Stop that. Wow. Should I try to hold it? I think I got, got it. help. Okay, there you go. Stay. Okay. okay. So we boiled the water, and we sealed it now, right? We sealed it. All right. Okay. So we're just going to let sit there, let that cool, for a little bit, and I'm going to show you an experiment that you guys can do at home, which is kind of a smaller version of this one. And what we need is a flame, and you can do this over a stove or something like that if you're careful, and then a soda can. And we're going to put just a little bit of water in the bottom. All right. Whoa. And I'm just going to heat this. And the water is going to start boiling. It's going to take a little while, so I'm just going to let it go. And then I'm going to flip it over. Instead of sealing off the top of it, because I can't do that anymore, 
I'm going to flip it over into this speaker here. So I think it's going pretty well right now. Okay, here I go. One, two, three. Oh! Look at that. And what happened is that was the water cooled, I didn't let any air from the surrounding atmosphere come in because I put it in the water and the there's a little vacuum inside and the atmospheric pressure crushed the can. Now you can kind of hear what's going on over here and hopefully something might happen. Oh, you can kind of see what's going on here. So this big 55 gallon drum now has, has collapsed pretty much the same way as the small can has. Yeah. And what has caused this is the great pressure on the outside is bigger than the pressure on the inside. And what we want you to think about is, we want everybody to think about is, how did the pressure on the inside get to be lower than the pressure on the outside? That's what we would like you to think about. Thank you very much, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. I need to do the next experiment over here. And I think I have just about everything, but oops. I need some, um, some hot boiling water. Could someone please bring me out some hot boiling water? Would you do that, please? Uh, thank you, Bucky. Hello, Bucky. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to, hello Bucky, welcome to my lab. I'm glad, I want everybody to notice that Bucky is a very good science student. He's got his goggles on. You see that, right? Right. Yes. And Bucky, Bucky's got his science is fun button too. You see that too. Well, Bucky, uh, let's do this experiment. I'm gonna take the hot boiling water. I'm gonna put it into this uh, dish pan, which is empty except for air, right? And now, do you see anything coming off the top? Steam. Well, ste steam is invisible. You can't see steam. This is called condensed water vapor. And uh, Bucky, you ready to do your uh, experiment now? All right. You're going to take this bucket of, of dry ice, and what are you going to do with it? Just let's do it. Let's do it. I'm ready. Yeah. Go ahead. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> This is how they make fog in the movies sometimes. They take hot boiling water, add dry ice to it, and you notice that the fog is moving in a downward direction, telling us, if we didn't know it, that carbon dioxide is heavier or denser than air. Right? So we can blow on this. We're still here. <laughs> well, Bucky, I know you're uh, studying for finals because they're coming up pretty soon, right? And Bucky, as I said, is a very good student. Uh, and I know, Bucky, uh, we should tell the, uh, the audience, how long is it going to take you to graduate? One, two, three, four. Four years. Wait, let me see this. I got, how many you got? I got five. Bucky's got four. But he's going to graduate in four years. And that's what all good students should try to do. Yes, yes. Now, Bucky, I know you have to go study for your final exams, but, but I wonder if, if you would, would like to stay for the rest of this program. Would you like Bucky to stay? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Bucky, I've got a seat saved for you right there, right at the corner. Thank you for coming once again to this very special program, Bucky. Thank you very much. And now it's time for another very special guest, to uh, come to my program. Hey, everybody! Oh. Hey! Hey, hey! Hello! Merry Christmas! Hey, hey, hey! Merry Christmas! Hey! Wow! You have such a cheery laboratory. 
It's the laboratory of Shakashuri. Hello, Santa. Welcome to my lab. It is my pleasure. I'm, so, I'm so, ha so happy, to, so happy to, he to see you here and, and to hear your bells ring, as oh. always. Uh, I, I know you've been very busy with the elves and with, with Mrs. Claus in your workshop, right? Everything yes. has been working. Did you, by the way, did you get my list? That real long one? Well, it wasn't that, well, that well, long. I, I, yes, I, I did. I, I hope, got your list. I hope you got me some of the things that I asked for. I, I did. I, and then I, I, oh. I've been good. Haven't I been good? Has he been good? Uh-huh. Well, I know you asked for some money. Yes, I did. And the best I could do was the wallet. Well, the wallet. You can put the money in. All right, all right. That's, that's yeah. good. It's, it's, it's got the special money in it's it. It's got the it's special got, stuff right. in there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Santa. But here's something that I know you've always wanted. Oh, yes. This is a special mug. It says, science is fun in the lab of Shakashiri. Yeah. <laughs> it thank, is. Thank you, Santa. You're welcome. You're thank welcome. Thank you, Santa. Thank you. But this is something I know that you have really been looking forward to. A very special book. It's hot off the press. Oh, yes, it is. This is my own book. <laughs> we my had own? to get your copy. This is, this is, uh, well, shall I open it and, and read something do. to the audience? Would, would that do. be all right if I did that? Yes. Hmm? Oh. It's a hot book. This is a real hot book. <laughs> well, uh, Shall I close it now? You close it up. You and your, you and your elves have been really, really busy. Let's uh, show the audience what's inside Please this do. book. Yes, inside this book are two batteries that have stored in them chemical energy. And then there is a light bulb up here, and then there is a flint that has been soaked with lighter fluid. And what you should be able to see now that there is a small button down here Right down, right here. Where is it? I'll find it. There, right there. And when I push the button, the stored chemical energy changes into electrical energy and lights this light bulb. But this light bulb, like all light bulbs, is not 100% efficient. In addition to giving us light energy, it gives off heat energy. And the heat ignites the uh, flint. So let's push the button here. Be careful. Put this away from my face. Push the button. And there it is. That's how this works. A hot book. A real hot book. Thank you very much, Santa. You're welcome. Thank you. It Thank you very much. Santa? I thought I would spend some time in your laboratory. Please do, by you, all means. You and all of your assistants have been doing all these workshops. Yes. You have such wonderful things to do here. You do fundamental things, don't you? We do fundamental things. Do you do elemental things? We work with elements, yes. What kind of elements? All kinds of elements, chemical elements. Which, which would you like one? So I thought I heard something as I was circling. Did I hear some booms? Yes, there were some booms. And those were from there elements? Were. So from elements, yes. And do you have any other elements? We have other elements. We Show have, me one. Well, we have bromine right here. Bromine. We have the element bromine. Oh, my. I'll set bromine. it right here. It's okay. in this very special apparatus. It's sealed. Mm -hmm. And bromine is a liquid at room temperature. It's one of five chemical elements that are liquids around room temperature. And it evaporates. It changes to a vapor as well. And the color that we see in this sealed tube is the color of the bromine the brown vapor. Bromine. Okay. All right, so I've got that element. Do you have any other elements? I come from the North Pole. Do you have anything really cold? Really cold? Really cold. I've got liquid nitrogen. That's even colder than the North Pole. Yeah. Where is well, it? it is. I have it right here. Well, let's put it into this container. All right. Let me see if we can't pour some into that container. Okay. This is liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen has a boiling temperature of about uh, 321 degrees below zero. That's on the Fahrenheit scale. Now, you used the Celsius scale in, before. In science, we use the Celsius scale. You know that, 196, 196 degrees below zero on the Celsius scale. That's colder than the North Pole. Now, I wonder what would happen, Sam, if we were to turn this over, this very special piece of apparatus, nice and straight here, and if we were to put the end, boy, how come I can hold this thing? This is a very special flask. It's very cold inside, but the special flask has no air in between the two layers of glass, so it's a thermos bottle. And so it's not cold on the outside. And so the material inside is boiling cold. Does that mean it's freezing hot? Hmm. Why don't we put this underneath, and we will drop that in just a little bit and see if we can't 
notice any changes taking place? Do you see any changes taking place? Yeah. We're doing chemistry here in the lab of Shakashiri. What changes do you see taking place? Yeah, yeah it's getting kind of red, red-orange in there. Uh, notice the gas is becoming less and less. I can begin to see more and more. Whoa, what's happening on the top? No. It just froze right over. It got cold up here, but I put the refrigerant down here. Let's put a little more in. More is better sometimes. <laughs> Ooh. Whoa. How come it's boiling up there? Wait, you're cooling it down here. It's and frozen up there, and it's a sealed tube, yeah? Pour a little and more. Pour a little more. So we actually have, the, uh, whoa, the three states of matter. The solid, the liquid, and the gas. Yes. Okay. And this is for the element bromine. Yes. Well, all this is getting really cold up here. In fact, I don't see much liquid left at all. It's solid right now. I see it solid up there. In fact, I don't see any liquid at all. Well, that was kind of neat. I'm There's liquid right there. Again? Very interesting. Very interesting. Boy, you do some exciting experiments here. So do you, Santa. Well, you know, at this time of year, we sometimes tend to eat a little too much. And so Mrs. Claus and I decided that we would bring you something just for the holidays. A chemical for, for the holidays. Chemical for the holidays. It says on it, milk of magnesia. Which is? Uh, it says also on it, antacid. Oh, it's against acid. It's against acid. So, so it's the opposite of an acid. Right. So if, so if we overeat, is that what you're suggesting? That's exactly right. Yeah? Then we have to use some of this. A little bit of that. A little fact, bit of this. Okay. Well, look, you know, it's already got an indicating cap on the top. If I take the cap off, that's how much we should use. It says on it to shake it a little bit. Shake it up real well. Shake, oh, re shake it a lot. Okay. Because milk of magnesia... Magnesium hydroxide is not soluble. It doesn't dissolve in water real well. This Santa knows a lot of chemistry. He's, he's well, right. chemistry huh? is fun. Huh? Isn't science fun? And we have one of these little tiny beakers. Well, it's tiny at the North Pole. <laughs> and it, we can spin a bar inside to get this to mix up real well. And what I would like to do then is to show you this well mixed milk of magnesia, we'll put one serving, so to speak, or one dose inside, and you can see how well it distributes. It mixes up real well there. It looks an awful lot like milk, does it not? Now, what Senate would like to do is to show you that there are materials, such as we have in these test tubes, that can show if it's antacid, or we sometimes call it a base, versus acid, and we get different colors. And let me just put a little of that indicating solution in. And what would you say? Is this on the basic side, or is this on the acidic side? It's on the basic side. What color is this? That's a beautiful purple. That's what happens for milk and magnesia in this container. How about if you put a little bit of acid in, for example, stomach acid? That should change this, shouldn't it? What I'm going to do is put a little bit of, not stomach acid, but vinegar in here. Just a little bit of vinegar. Vinegar is not stomach acid, but it'll have the same property. Oh, sure, it takes a while to mix. <laughs> now, what color is that, Bissam? Well, it looks yellow. I was going to say yellow, but it's changing. It's changing? Yes, it's back to being... So there must be some milk of magnesia in there. How yeah. can you tell? Well, we can look at the color change, and I can't see through this. Oh, what word would you use if you can't see through something? Uh, opaque. It's opaque. Okay, good word. You have been a good boy. Well, thank Let you, Let me put Santa. a little bit more in. All right. That'd be like adding a little bit of French fries, I guess. Oh. More acid has to be excreted. How about if we put the whole hamburger in? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh it's getting quite red. Can you see through it? Uh, not quite. No, you can't quite. No. no. I guess we got to go out and have a full meal. All right. Overeat again? Overeat again. Don't do that now no, don't during do that. the holidays. But that's what would happen, right? That's what would happen. If you did, you'd have to get another dose of milk of magnesia. Oh, it's getting clearer now. I can see through the solution, yes. My goodness. I'm double parked. The sleigh is double parked. But Sam, 
Thank Have you. Have a Merry Christmas. And the same to you, Santa. Thank you. Thank you for stopping Bye. by. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you, Santa. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Be good, kids. Thank you so Merry much for Christmas. coming. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you. At this time, I would like you to welcome one of the younger people who work in my lab. Please welcome Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. What do you have for us here? Well, I've been using this simple device to measure the conductivity of different liquids. And I'd like to show you what I found. All right. First, we have to plug in this adapter, which changes the voltage from 110 volts to 12 volts. All right. So if you could do that. Certainly. Plug it in. Yeah. All right. We've got power. Thank you. All right. In the middle of this wooden board here, we have a light bulb. And at the other end, we have a probe. So to measure the conductivity of something, you simply insert the probe in the liquid, and the light bulb should light up. Now, do you have anything metal just so we can test to make sure that this will work? We've got a spoon. I got a spatula here. Great. All right. Now let's see here. And the light bulb lights up. I can see that. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. OK. Now we have four beakers. I'm glad you brought your beakers with you. Now, do you have any water? I have water. OK. Let me get you some water. If you could pour a little in that beaker, a that'd little, be great. How much is a little? About half. About half, all right. How about that much? That's great. All right. OK, and now we'll take this probe and stick it in the water and see what happens. What do you see? Nothing. A, nothing. A light bulb didn't come on. That's because water is not a conductor of electricity. Huh. Now, let's try something else. How about we try some water with salt? Salt. Would you like me to find some salt? Yeah. Right? I have salt right here. OK, if you could pour the water in. Put, the, put water in this. About the same amount? Yep. OK. And now we'll put the salt in. All right. Whoa. Now, do you think we should turn the lights down for this? Let's try. OK, let's, let's try turn turning the, light the lights down. down. OK. Lights, well, the light's down. We'll OK. Try. And we'll put the probe in the salt water. That's pretty bright. You can see that, right? <laughs> what, what does that mean, Elizabeth? This means that salt water is a good conductor of electricity. All right. Now, we can also try some other household liquids. Do you have any vinegar? I have vinegar, yes. Would you like some? Yes, please. In this? In that third in this beaker right Third there. beaker, about the same amount? Yes. All right, I got that part. OK, and we'll rinse off the probe first, so we don't, because we don't want to contaminate the vinegar. Oh, can we turn the lights some more down? What do you see? Very faint light. Just barely. Barely, barely visible. So what does that mean? This means that vinegar is just a slight conductor of electricity. All right. Now, how about we try some household ammonia? Household ammonia. I think I have that here someplace. I have, yes, household ammonia. OK. If you could pour about the same amount. About the same amount in there. You're going to rinse again in between measurements? Right. That's good. OK, and now we put the probe in the household ammonia. Uh-huh. It's still faint. Yeah. Yeah. Does everyone see that? Yeah. What does that no, mean? This means that ammonia is also a slight conductor of electricity, but a little bit more than vinegar. I see. Now, what do you think would happen if we mix the vinegar and the ammonia together? Why don't we try it and find out? What do you guys think? Should we try it? OK. So what does that mean? This means that there is a chemical reaction taking place between the vinegar and the ammonia. Very good. Thank you, Elizabeth. You're That's welcome. a very wonderful experiment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have other experiments for us that you've been working on? Um, 
Well, do you have that white powder that we were talking about earlier? Oh, yes, I have the white powder. I have the white powder here, and I think you, you asked not only for the white powder, but you asked for um, a burner, and I have the burner right here. So if I may just put it over there. And what shall we do with this now, this well, white powder? We should heat the white powder. We should heat it, just like this. Um, is this white powder is not a household chemical. It's actually called potassium chlorate. It's a very strong oxidizing agent. And what we want to try to do is heat it up so that it melts. And if, we, if you look closely at it, you can begin to see that the solid is melting. And we have almost all of it melted, not quite. It'll turn into a liquid, and you can see the liquid beginning to boil. It is boiling, and uh, so there it is. It's, it's, all, it's, it's almost all melted now. It is melted. What should we do now? Well, I really like Cheetos. So do you think we should try to oxidize a cheese Cheeto? Well, let's try. Okay. Let's try. What are you going to do now? I'm going to take the Cheeto, and I'm going to drop it in there. Whoa. Can we turn the lights down? Whoa. Whoa. That's really neat, Elizabeth. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Elizabeth. What I'd like to do now is an experiment that perhaps you would like to do at home. This experiment shows you how to remove tarnish from silver. You may have some silverware at home that is tarnished, just like I do over here. I have these two spoons that are full, that are tarnished. You can see that what they are. And what you, what you need to do to remove the tarnish, is that something you might want to do? All right, what you need is some aluminum foil that you put in a pan, I, any kind of pan. I'm using a, a Pyrex uh, vessel right here for that. You uh, line it up like this, and then you get some hot water. Boiling water would be good. That's what I have going over here. And you put that in the dish pan. Now, what do you see coming off the top there? Condensed water vapor, not just water vapor, condensed water vapor. And <clears throat> what you do next is add some baking soda. That's what I have here, baking soda. So you add the baking soda like this, and the baking soda dissolves in the water. And the next thing that you do is you take one of the two spoons that I have here, I'm going to just use one, and put it in the hot water that has in it the baking soda leaving the other one on the side, and you can see within just a few moments that the tarnish is actually being removed. Can you see that? Can you see that? It's almost gone. <laughs> now, when you do this experiment, you use very common household chemicals but please be careful with the hot water because we don't want anyone to burn their hands or any other part of their body. Now what I'd like to ask you to do now is to welcome to my lab a very close colleague and a friend, and that's Dr. Rodney Schreiner. Rodney? Thank you. Hi, Rod. Thank you. Hi, Balsam. What do we have here? Well, I've got some uh, things I brought from home. All right. A bowl. And, uh, well, I think everybody's got one of these or something like it. What is this? It's a tub. Right. It's got a lid on it. What's it made of? Plastic. Plastic. Right. It's made of plastic. You know what chemists call plastic? Polymer. Hey, we have a chemist in the audience. <laughs> It's a polymer, that's right. Now, when we have these containers, we usually use them to store things. And I have something stored in here. You tell me what, it's, what this is. 
What does that look like? It's spaghetti. Right, spaghetti noodles. Now, spaghetti noodles have something in common with this polymer. Spaghetti noodles, as you all know, are long and skinny. Polymer molecules are just like this. They're long and skinny. So polymers behave a lot like a plate of spaghetti. Now, when you eat spaghetti, and some people do this, uh, they put the fork in and they turn the fork to gather the spaghetti. Do you do that? Yeah, some of you do that. I do that too. But I like spaghetti, and I find that when I eat it so often, this is a lot of work. So I've made it a little easier for myself. I've motorized my fork. Let's see, this is how I use it. I put the fork into the spaghetti and turn on the motor. <laughs> Look what happens. The spaghetti is climbing up the fork. Polymers do exactly the same thing. Now I'm gonna show you a polymer which does this. You probably have it at home. Actually, it's in your garage or if you have a four-wheel drive vehicle, it's actually inside the transfer case of your four-wheel drive vehicle. It's a liquid that looks like this. And when the axle that's connected to that rotates, see what that liquid does? And as the axle turns faster, the liquid climbs even further. Yeah, that is cool. <laughs> so the way, the way this works in, in your four-wheel drive vehicle is uh, when the wheel loses traction, it starts spinning. It spins and the polymer wraps around it and grabs it and stops it from spinning. So the power goes to one of the other wheels instead. So that, you might have, you probably have never seen this happen inside your four-wheel drive vehicle. <laughs> However, if you've ever made bread, you have seen something like this, or like the spaghetti. What does it take to make bread? What are the ingredients? The ingredients are, yes, flour, some flour, and in case you want to reproduce this, this is uh, two cups of flour. Uh, for the metrically minded, that's uh, 500 cubic centimeters. It also takes water. And I've got half as much water as I had flour. So I'll put the water in with the flour. Then in order to make bread, I've got to mix the two together. I brought my mixer with me. I'll plug it in. Check, make sure it works. Yep, it works. So I'll put it into the bowl with the flour and water and start mixing. Can you see what's happening? The dough made from flour and water starts climbing up the mixer. It's doing the very same thing that the spaghetti did because in the dough, there are long, skinny molecules just like spaghetti. Now, if I really wanted to make bread, there's another ingredient I'd have to add. Yeast. I'd need to add yeast. Yeast grows and feeds on some of the flour, and it gives off carbon dioxide gas. But the gas is trapped inside the dough, so the bubbles of gas can't get away. The dough just enlarges. Then you take the dough and you put it in the oven, and you dry it out. You dry the water out of the dough, and you get what? Bread. You get this. Something that looks like that. This is a polymer foam. <laughs> it's an edible polymer foam. When you eat it inside your stomach, the foam becomes wet, and the bread collapses. Now, any time you take a polymer foam and get it wet, it will collapse. 
provided you get it wet with the correct liquid. Now there is another polymer foam I'm sure all of you are familiar with, one you probably have never eaten, I hope you've not tried to eat it, namely this one right here. You've all seen this, right? If you've received any packages in the mail, sometimes things come packed with this. What is this? Packing peanuts. These are made of a polymer called polystyrene, and it is a foam. It's got little bubbles of air trapped in it. It's made the same way bread is made, putting bubbles into a dough made of plastic, polymer. And now these will collapse if you put them into the right liquid. The right liquid you probably have at home, too. It's this one, acetone. Now, you probably don't have a bottle at home that looks like this and says acetone in large letters, <laughs> unless you're a chemist. But you probably do have at home a bottle that says fingernail polish remover. Yes. And if you look at the small print on the bottom, you'll see it says acetone. So I'll put some fingernail polish remover, also called acetone, in this beaker and put some of these packing peanuts in there. Let's see what happens. Can you see what's happening? They're fizzing because the gas trapped inside is coming out. In fact, I can't keep up with it. I can't keep up with it. So you're making the, the peanut styrofoam collapse. You're not dissolving it. it. No, it's, it's not dissolving. I'm the just foam making the foam collapse. And uh, the material from the, the polymer from the polystyrene is still there in the bottom. Very nice. Thank you very much, Rod. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you're welcome. You. Now to do still more experiments with household chemicals, I would like you to join in welcoming Julie Fraser. Julie? Hi, everybody. Hi, Julie. Hi. What do you have there? I have some common liquids you find around the house. The first is honey. The second is water. The third is vegetable oil. And the fourth? is rubbing alcohol. And I also have this tall glass cylinder. I'm going to pour them one by one in this order into the cylinder. We'll see what happens. All right. First, I'll take the honey, pour it in. It's thick and viscous, so it takes a while to pour, as you probably know. I'll put it in the bottom. There we go. That's enough. I'm going to take the water next. I'm going to add some food coloring to make it prettier. Look at that. And we're carefully going to add the water from the next layer. Watch what's happening. When I pour the water in, it creates a second layer on top because it's less dense. The third layer, I'm going to take the vegetable oil and pour it in. Watch what happens. Oops, three layers. And the fourth liquid is the rubbing alcohol. I'm going to put some red food coloring in to make it look nicer. Shake it up. Pour it in. And there we have it. With four common... We've taken four common liquids we find around the house and made a, a four-layer density column with the densest liquid on the bottom and the least dense on the top. On the top. Mm -hmm. And they don't mix with each other. They don't mix with each other. Very nice. 
And next, we'll take a large beaker full of water and two sodas, one diet, one regular, drop them in and see what happens. One sunk and one float, floated. Which one's floating? The diet. And the, and the regular soda is sunk. It's similar to the, the honey and the water in the density column, where the honey is really a thick sugar solution and the water with the water floating on top. And the, and the sodas do the same thing. Very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> For my next experiment, I took a, a two liter bottle that used to have soda in it, and I, I took a, a sauce package um, from a package of egg rolls. You can see the sauce is in there, it's sealed, and there's a little air bubble in the sauce package. Uh -huh. What I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze the bottle and see what happens. It so sinks, what, and what, I release it, and it floats. So what you have in there is, is water mm -hmm. and this sealed sauce packet, mm -hmm. right? With a little air bubble. Yes. And I add, I squeeze the bottle. That increases the pressure inside uh -huh. the bottle. The air bubble in the sauce package shrinks. It makes the packet more dense, and it sinks. I release the pressure. The Comes air bubble up. expands, and it floats. Very nice, Julie. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Now I'd like to ask you to join in welcoming one of the most outstanding high school chemistry teachers in the country. That's Kathleen Dumbrink, who comes to us from McClure North High School near St. Louis. Hi, Kathy. Welcome to my lab. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm going to do an experiment for you in this very special round flask. You can see that I've already placed a clear, colorless liquid in the flask, but now I'm going to add some more liquids. Basam, can you help me with that? Certainly. Here's our second liquid. Clear and colorless. And here is our third liquid. Also clear and colorless. Oh. I'm going to stopper it, and now I'm going to start mixing the three liquids. Now let me tell you something about one of those liquids. It happens to be a liquid that has sugar in water. And it's the very same sugar that you have sitting on your kitchen table. Now, when we added all three together, did you observe closely? Did you see what happened when we put all three together? There was a color change. We saw that when you added the third liquid, it was kind of brown, wasn't it? Was it after the second or the third? A third. third. You're a good observer here. So let's see what's happening in there now. Well, it's turning, the color of the liquid is turning black, kind of black. Kind, oh, oh. You starting to see anything? Yeah, I'm starting to see a reflection of myself in there. You're starting to see yourself yeah, yeah, in the flask? Not, not quite, but it's getting there. Well, I can see myself a oh. little bit. Maybe some of you in the front row can start seeing yourselves as well because one of the other solutions had a very special element in it. And what we've made here is something that you use to see your reflection. And what is that? A mirror. A mirror. The mirror is made out of silver. So we have made a silver mirror here. And of course, we could use it if you, say, wanted to check out your hair. Yes. Does his hair look OK there? I can see myself clearly now, yeah. All right. Let me check again. Oh, thank you. But there are other ways that we can use this. In fact, think about this. For the holiday season, what could we use this for? An ornament. We could use this for a holiday ornament. In fact, you can make your own holiday ornaments, perhaps this way here in the lab. Now, the Sam was so kind to invite me to his lab, so I have a special present for you. All right. Oh, thank you, Kathy. Let me just look in the, oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> then the next time you go around town and you see big ornaments during the holiday season, you know where these ornaments were made. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, I'm going to do another experiment for you. And in this experiment, I'm going to be using two liquids. Now, this liquid has some starch in it, the same starch that's in the potatoes that you eat. And what I'm going to do is pour this liquid into the liquid in the beaker, which is colorless and also clear. So let's watch what happens when I pour these two together. Is anything happening? Well, the volume increased a little bit, and that's about wow. it. Wow. Wait a minute. Oh. I think I see something. That was pretty exciting, wasn't it? Yes, it was, yeah. Well, that's what's called a delayed reaction, or in chemistry, we call that a clock reaction. And the blue color that appeared was due to some iodine that is formed in the reaction combining with the starch. Now, since it's a clock reaction, I think that we should time this reaction. So what I'm going to ask you to do is count when I mix the next one. And count along with me. So, Basam, will you help me with this? Of course. All right. So here we go. One, two, two three, three, four, five, six, six seven, eight, nine, ten. ten. Very good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. ten. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. ten. Very good. Very Ten's good. A lucky number. Very good, Kathy. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Happy holidays to you too. Now we come to the uh, grand finale of this very special program where I'm going to do an experiment and use two chemicals that are very common. One is called rust, iron oxide, and the other one is aluminum. They are in powder form. They're mixed together in uh, this flower pot which is placed inside another flower pot. You know, flower pots have a hole in the bottom. And what I'm going to do is turn the burn it on and get a sparkler. You've all used sparklers before and what you do is get it started and that is the aluminum. They, uh, sparklers are made of the same chemicals as I have in that mixture right there. And the sparks that we see are from the aluminum. So I'm going to put this in this flask like so and I want to show you that these two uh, flower pots are going to be placed inside this box on the stand like so and I'm going to use a bigger a bigger sparkler to get the reaction going and I want you to watch this carefully as I come over here stick this in there and This reaction, this spectacular reaction has gotten so hot that the aluminum and the iron have exchanged positions. The aluminum now combined with the oxygen from the iron and what we saw coming down as a stream was molten iron. So I'm going to show you this is very hot down here. I'm going to pick this up if I can. Oh, it's frozen in this bucket of sand down there. Oh, there it is. And you see it's glowing red hot right now. It was white hot before. This very same experiment was used in the 1800s to weld railroad tracks. This very same experiment contributed to winning the West. This is how the West was won in part in the 19th century. Well, I want to thank you for coming today to my special program. Remember, no matter what you do, science is fun. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much.